chapter 3, praise God, hallelujah, begin to touch on something tonight, and I want to be able to preach on this uh, for the coming weeks um, on Sunday night, but uh, chapter 3, this deals with the lame man that was healed, and oh, thank you, Brother John, if you can have those tonight, I appreciate that, I don't have anything, you guys are awesome back there, praise God, John, Mimi, Hannah, Hannah, God bless you, thank you, you guys do an awesome job, don't they, church, amen, in that sound booth, they really do, they really do, there's a lot of buttons and I don't like to mess with anything back there except how to turn it on and turn it off and that's about it. Praise God. Uh, Acts in chapter 3 and it said in verse 1, now Peter and John, now let's get a hold of this tonight. And Peter and John uh, went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried who they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful to ask alms from those who entered the temple. I mean money could work and have a job. He's lame. He's crippled. Who's seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask for alms or money or support or help, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. And so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now look at verse 7. And he took him by the right hand lifted him up. I love this. This is a demonstration of faith. He reached down, picked him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And so he leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. You know, when you're touched by the Lord, you're going to praise him. You can't help to praise him. When you have a touch of God, when, he, when God heals you, when God touches you, when God delivers you, when God fills you with the Holy Ghost, you're going to praise him. And notice he does this right in front of all the people. He didn't care. Jumping, walking, leaping, praising God. All the people saw that. Verse 10. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. I'd love to see the church filled with wonder and amazement again of what God can do. Amen. That's what I want to get back into the church. Uh, that the people, the body of Christ, wonderful folks like yourselves would just be filled with wonder and amazement at God and what God can do and what God is doing. Amen. Praise God. Tonight, I'd like to minister on this thought, subject, characteristics of true Pentecost. I want to talk about this here tonight. I thank God that we're a Pentecostal church. I do. I don't want to be Pentecostal in name only, but in action and faith and believing God. And I, 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 I praise God. And some of us that have been in the faith for a long time, we have had these encounters of Pentecost. We've had these encounters of the Holy Ghost. We've had the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I thank God for that. I want to see us have that again. I want to see our younger generation uh, have that, or upcoming church. I want to, uh, uh, them to experience the power of Pentecost in their lives as well. Tonight, uh, uh, at the end of the service at the altar call, I am going to call this church up here to pray. I want us to pray together. I want us to believe God together tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. The characteristics of true Pentecost. Father, I'm asking God for your help and your grace tonight to minister the word of the Lord. I pray that you would touch this body physically, give it strength, God, but also I pray that you touch my voice tonight. Father, I thank you that we've been able to gather together. This is sacred ground. It's holy ground, like we talked about this morning, Father. The Holy Ghost dwells inside of our hearts. Jesus, you're present in this place tonight, God. Strengthen us in our faith. Renew us and revive us in God. Let us be filled with wonder and amazement of who you are, and also what you're doing, God. I thank you, Lord. Let us just demonstrate the faith that we have in Christ tonight, praising you, giving you all glory, and asking this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. You may be seated, church. Hallelujah characteristics of, of true Pentecost. And what we see here with Peter and John is the expression of their faith. I want you to catch that. We see the expression of their faith. Uh, G Peter reaches down. They pray for him, but reaches down and picks up this lame man, and God healed him by the power of Almighty God. Not only are they saying something, but also they're doing something. They, they believe God for a miracle, and a miracle came, and a man was changed for eternity. A man's life, he was born 
poor and crippled. That's all that he knew, but now changed by the power of Almighty God. By the way, that's why we're here. We want to see people's lives changed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we preach. That's why we pray. That's why we have all these ministries. That's why this church is here. I would love to see God change and transform lives in Marion, Ohio. I believe that a lot of lives are not being impacted today because of a lack of believing and because of a lack of faith, even within the church, the body of Christ. I'm not indicating that we're not saved. I know that you are. I know that you love God. I know that you're saved and born again, but I'm, I'm indicating that a lot of lives remain unchanged, unaffected due to a lack of faith and a lack of believing God in the modern church of today. We have everything, but I'm telling you, we're lacking the power of the Holy Spirit today. My beloved friends, uh, Peter and John believed. Peter and John had experienced the life-changing power of God, and they were living in that power, living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, I desire true Pentecost. Amen. I'm not talking about a denomination. I'm not talking about an organization. I'm talking about what I believe the church ought to be today. We see it in the book of Acts. As the Holy Ghost came upon the church, and they went forth in power and in boldness, and were preaching the word of God. It didn't matter if persecution came or not. It did not stop them. They had the fire. They had the Holy Ghost. They had boldness, and miracles were taking place in the early church. Amen. I, I, this is what the church ought to be today, and what Christians should be today. Now, there are some elements I hope to bring out today, tonight, of the characteristics of true Pentecost. It's my prayer that by the grace of God, that this will spark a flame in our hearts, that we would desire more of Jesus, more of God, more of his spirit, more of his presence, more of his power, more of his word. We can talk about Pentecost, and we can read books about Pentecost, but what each of us needs today is a true experience of Pentecost in our own lives. Amen. I, 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 I want it today. I want God today. I want his presence today. I want the Holy Ghost now. Amen. Now, we can learn something from these passages. Now, first one, chapter 3 of Acts, it says, now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the house of prayer or the hour of prayer. Amen. I mean, think about this, my friend. These were men of God. These were men of faith. These were men of integrity. And they were going to the temple of prayer. And they're going to the temple to spend time in God's presence. And they're going to seek his face. And now understand that Acts chapter 3 is right after Acts chapter 2. Right after Pentecost. Right after the pouring of the Holy Ghost. And notice what they're doing. Basically, they're going to church. Amen. They're going to the house of prayer. They're going to seek the face of God. Let me just tell you this. That when you have had a true touch of God. When there's been a true moving of the Holy Ghost in your life. You want more of Jesus. Not less. Amen. When God really has touched you. When God has truly poured out his spirit upon you. You want more of God. Not less of God. You want to praise God. You want to worship God. You want to pray. Hallelujah. They had just spent 10 days in that upper room. And then God poured out the Holy Ghost and divided tongues as a fire came upon them. And now what are they doing at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? They're going to the temple to pray. They're going to pray. They're going to seek the face of God. Hallelujah. There's something to be said about men and women who pray. It, doesn't make, it, it does make a difference in a person's life. It makes a difference in the church. It makes a difference in the marriage. It makes a difference in the home. It makes a difference in your ministry and how you worship and how you praise God. Prayer makes a difference in our relationship with Jesus. Amen. And the reason a lot of Christians are struggling today is because they're simply not praying. The reason why the church today, uh, I'm telling you, lacks the power and the presence of God. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not talking about the church lacking a lot of other things, but I'm the one essential element that we must, what good is all this if we don't have the Spirit of God? What good is all this if we don't have the Holy Ghost? What good is all this if we don't have the presence of the Lord? What good is all this? We're just going through some kind of religious exercise. Folks, listen, I don't want to waste your time, and I don't want you to waste my time of going through some kind of religious exercise. I've come here tonight to meet him. I've come to see Jesus, glory to God. And I pray that we would have a heart of expectation that says, I want to see Jesus. I want to see the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. I want to have an experience, an encounter with God and the God of heaven. Amen. And you can, if you'll reach out, if you'll believe, if you'll trust, you can. 
I, I don't know how to make it more clear that the only thing holding you back is you. I love you. I, I adore you. I appreciate you. You're wonderful. You're family in Christ. I, I thank God for you. But really, the only thing holding us back is ourselves. Hallelujah. There is a river. There is a fountain. There is a well. Glory to God. You can go to God anytime, any place, and call upon heaven. And I believe God can touch you driving down your, the road in your car, at your workplace, in your home, in the kitchen, cutting grass. God can pour out. You can encounter to the Lord and you'll see that God's not dead but God's alive amen amen, amen. amen. <laughs> hallelujah now folks we talk about prayer but that doesn't mean that we're praying uh, let me ask you this husbands do you pray with your wife Husband, do you pray with your wife? And wife, do you pray with your husband? Because I'm going to tell you, that's what's going to keep that marriage alive. That's what's going to keep that marriage faithful. That's what's going to keep the flame in the heart in that marriage for one another is when you pray together. Thank God. I love my wife. She's a praying woman. She's a Bible-believing woman. She loves the Word of God. But it's only because of God that has brought such a unity and a love and a lasting marriage, I believe, with all of my heart. And I thank God that he put her in my life. I'm just hoping and praying she's thankful God put me in her life. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, praise God. But I'm telling you, that's what makes a difference. How can a house, how can a house have the spirit and the presence of God without prayer? How can a family have the unity of the spirit of God without prayer? It is impossible. Amen, church. Amen. Excuse me if I get a little excited with this, but show me a shallow prayer life, and I'll show you a person who has a shallow relationship with God. Carnal Christians don't pray. Fleshly Christians don't pray. Uh, they know uh, they should and, and they know it's the right thing to do, but they simply don't do it. Uh, flesh dictates their life rather than being led by the Holy Ghost. Uh, now, many times we're desire driven rather than being led by the Spirit of God. Men that don't pray won't grow spiritually in the Lord. Uh, they just won't. They might be church going men, but they won't grow to the full stature of Christ. Uh, men who don't pray will never know the mind of God. Prayer is essential for the vitality of the Christian life. Without it, we'll die. Without it, we'll wither on the vine. Without it, we're powerless and ineffective. Listen, we might have lots of activity, but very little spiritual impact in our lives or in this city without much prayer. Uh, Peter and John went up to the temple to pray. Three o'clock in the afternoon, they're, they're going to seek God. And, and a miracle took place. They came across this man that was a, he was lame from his mother's womb. He had no life what to speak of. But, but being led by the Holy Ghost, sensitive to the Spirit of God, the Lord prompted them to pray for him. Silver and gold I don't have. I don't have money. I don't have the things of this life, of this world. But what I do have, thank God he had it. What I do have, I give to you. And then he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up. Up and walk. He had, what did he have? He had faith. What did he have? He had Jesus. What did he have? He had the name of Jesus. He had the power of Almighty God. My friend, the church has money, but it doesn't have power to raise the dead or heal the sick. Amen. Come on. Oh, Lord God, have mercy. It's true. Uh, I'm telling you, we, we, we live by the circumstances of life rather than living by faith. I mean, Peter and John could have said, well, you know, uh, they, they could have said, let me tell you, there's, there's another, uh, maybe we can sit you, there's some medicine maybe we can give you that we could put you on the couch. We can talk to you a little bit about your upbringing and uh, how your parents treated you and all that kind of nonsense. No, 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 no. That's not what they needed. They needed a church. They needed Christians that knew God, that knew how to touch heaven, that knew how to grab a hold of the hem of his garment. They needed good people like yourselves. He needed somebody like you uh, that could lay hands and pray and believe God. God for healing. Oh, church, when you've, when you've tapped into the life source, when you've tapped into the power source, uh, you have uh, uh, the blessings of God, the benefits of God, the power of God, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus that can set the captive free. Uh, someone said that prayer is not us trying to persuade God, but it's God trying to persuade us. Uh, the answer to all problems is right here in this verse. Uh, the answer to all broken marriages is here. The answer to a demon possession 
dispossessed world is right here. The answer to a nation that is on the brink of destruction like America is right here. The answer to a rebellious teenager is right here. The answer to a Christ the society is right here. Second Chronicles and 714 says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. It's not hard, church. It's not difficult. The Bible makes it very clear and plain to us. But the one thing most people have a hard time doing today is bowing the knee to God in prayer. I feel the presence of God as I say those very words. We suffer because of it. If we really want to see people saved and delivered and changed, then we must pray for them. God is looking for interceders to cry out to him and to cry out to souls to be saved. Oh God, a powerful passage, a very short passage, but a powerful one is in Jeremiah chapter five and verse one. And it says, if you can find a man, Look at that verse if you want. Jeremiah 5 and 1. If you can find a man. Hallelujah. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. And see now and know and seek in the broad places there places thereof. If you can find a man. If there be any that executeth judgment that seeketh the truth. And I will pardon it. If you can find a man. If you can find a man that will pray. A man that will intercede. A man that will get along with God. If you can find a man that will go to the temple at the ninth hour to pray if you can find a church that has its doors open on Sunday night if you can find a church that will see God oh church if you can find a people oh like yourselves your perfect candidates for to pray and to seek and to knock and to turn from their sin then God will hear and God will forgive and God will heal is there a candidate tonight is there somebody that God can use tonight if I can find a man. Mm. Hallelujah. If we want healing in our homes, if we want healing in our marriages, if we want healing in our children, if we want healing in that rebellious teenager, if we want healing in our churches, if we want healing in our nation, then we must find a man that will pray. If you can find a man, you know what I mean, woman, person, if you can find a person, if you can find a man, if you can find a candidate, if you can find somebody that's willing. Listen, all of you qualify. Are you saved tonight? Are you saved tonight? You qualify. Hey, man, you know, we ought to do is raise our hands unto God and say, God, use me like he did with Isaiah. Who will go before me? Who can I send? Isaiah said, use me if you can find a man. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Use me. Use me. Glory. Glory. I'm talking about the characteristics of Pentecostal people. Amen. Praise God. This is what we see here today. Before the Welsh revival came in the early 1900s, some folks recognized the great need for revival. They said, man, we need a move of God. We need revival. There's a lot of apathy in the church, and we need God to move. We need an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We need a spiritual awakening. And at a convention, they'd ask for volunteers to pray for one. And there was a young man who was a teenager by the name of Evan Roberts, and he accepted the challenge to pray for revival. He, if I can find a man. And Evan Roberts said, I'm the man. I'm a young man. I'm a teenager, but I'm with they said, all right, Mr. Evan Roberts, you're the man. You begin to seek God, and you pray for revival, a teenager. And so Evan Roberts prayed continually, not for one year, not for two years, not for three, not for five, not for eight, not for 10, not for 12, but for 13 years. I want you to catch this. For 13 years, this man, this young man prayed for revival until revival came. He was a coal miner. Can you believe this? He was a coal miner. He said he would hear the swearings and the curses and the blasphemies of men. He said, but revival swept Wales. I mean, the power of God came. Revival came. No longer was he hearing cursings and swearings when he was going down into those old cold mine caves but now he heard men that hearts were broken by the power of God saved and delivered by the blood of Jesus singing hymns and praises unto God as they went down amen in that coal mine 
That's what God can do. Changes the heart. <laughs> if God can just find one that'll earnestly seek his face. If God can just find one that'll feel the passion and the burden to pray. If God can just find a vessel that'll be used to pour himself out. If the church can catch the breath of God. If a people can feel the heart of God, the heartbeat of the Lord. Hallelujah. Have you ever felt what God feels? Has God ever allowed you to feel at times what he feels? The burden, the passion for the lost, the passion for souls. Have you ever agonized? Have you ever, have you ever wept before the Lord as God allows you to be able to feel or to sense a little bit of what God feels? I, I, I think many times we're just numb to this, but I can tell you God wants to see the lost saved. He came to seek and to save the lost. God, he gave his all. God gave his son so that, so that uh, the lost can be saved. He gave his all. He poured heaven out. God gave his best. God gave his only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God gave us all. Can you imagine the, 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 the moms and dads today whose son gave their, their, his life or son or daughter gave their life on the line for the freedom of our country? They, their blood was spilt on foreign lands, whether it be in Afghanistan or other places, uh, to protect the rights and the freedoms of this nation. But to see it being stripped away little by little, the freedoms being taken away to where we're becoming a socialistic, communistic uh, nation now. Can you imagine how the parents must feel feel how this nation and part of it and part of the government has rejected the freedoms that the men and women have given by protecting our borders, by giving their life uh, and by shedding their blood that we might have freedom in America. But how does God feel when people have rejected his son and rejected the cross and rejected what God has given by pouring out the blood of his son for our sins that we can be saved. Lord God, have mercy. Oh, my friend, if God can find a people that'll bend, uh, that'll be broken, that'll be contrite in their heart, a soft heart, a broken heart, a contrite heart, a loving heart, a compassionate heart, a people that'll be caught up in doing his will. There's no telling what could happen. God moved mightily in that Welch revival. And they said suddenly, like an unexpected tornado, the spirit of God swept over the land all Wales was aflame with a revi mighty revival. The churches were so crowded that hundreds were unable to get in. You had to get there an hour or two early to get a seat because people were busting through the doors so hungry for God, so hungry for the presence of the Lord. Oh, church, if we don't have revival, if we don't have a the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, we're going to be dead. We're going to dry up. There won't be a Pentecostal church left in America. In fact, it'll be Pentecostal in name only, but not in action and not in life. There's going to come a day when people are going to say, Pastor Mark was right, and we didn't listen. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm appalled for the lack of hunger for God today. And I, I, you can't tell, am I, am I a weirdo? Don't answer that. But before I knew I was called, before I knew I'd be a pastor, before I went into the ministry, I love to be in the presence of God. I mean, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, you, I mean, Jimmy Swaggart Ministries and the presence and the glory of God in some services. Uh, yes, there was just a greater moving of God, some maybe less, but nonetheless, I, I don't think I ever went into a service where I never felt the, proud, the power and the presence and the glory of God. People hungry for the Lord. I was hungry for the Lord. I just wanted God. Hard to keep me in my in one pew. I mean, I'd jump and praise and shout and give God the glory. Praise God. Just about every time those altars were open, I was down there praying. Uh, why? Because I just wanted God. I wanted the presence of the Lord. I wanted to worship God. I wanted to glorify. I mean, I, I, I was one of those that sat on the edge of my seat wondering what that preacher was going to preach on. Amen. God's got something for me. God's going to speak a word into my heart, whether it be Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night, or whatever. I came believing and expecting God to hear from heaven. God can speak. God can talk to you. But it takes faith. Uh, I, I, but you can't tell me that, that, uh, that I'm the only one. No. 
No, oh, my beloved friends, if we're serious about Pentecost and if we really want Pentecost again, we must be willing to pray. We must be willing to pray. I'll be honest, many times we want Pentecost on someone else's expense. Uh, we want it, but we don't want to uh, sweat for it. We don't want to work for it. We don't want to uh, pray for it. Uh, we want the glory of God. We want the presence of God. We want the touch of God, the power of God, the anointing of God. We want the unction of God, but we're, 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 we're not willing to go through our Garden of Gethsemane to obtain it. I want somebody else to pray for it. I want somebody else uh, to do the work. Well, that person will be blessed. That person will receive the power and the presence and glory of God. Jesus said to the disciples, couldn't you watch with me for one hour? Amen. I, I didn't put the scripture down. I'm sorry, Brother John, uh, but couldn't you pray with me for one hour? Couldn't you spend time at the foot of the cross for one hour? One hour in my presence? Uh, one hour seeking my face? Uh, one hour crying out to me? Uh, one hour interceding? And then Jesus said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And, and Jesus knew what was about to happen. I want you to know this now. He knew what was about to happen. He knew the disciples would scatter at his arrest. He knew that Peter would fall into temptation by denying Christ. And Jesus was trying to prepare them for what was coming ahead. Couldn't you watch with me for one hour? What if there's a test around the corner for you and I, my friends? What if there's temptation lurking around the corner, around the door? What if there's a trial or a test or temptation that's about to take place in your life Amen. the question is are we prepared are we prayed up when you don't pray you find yourself vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy when you don't pray you find yourself succumbing to temptations otherwise you would not succumb to when you don't pray men ought to pray always and not faint Listen, what, what if there is a temptation? What if there's a trial? The question is, are we prepared? Are we prayed up? Are we ready for what lies ahead? See, there are storms and there's troubles and there's trials and difficulties. There's sorrows. There's hardships. There, there's satanic attack and spiritual oppression on warfare. But are we praying? Are we prepared? Have we found strength from God while in prayer? Amen. There, there's strength and there's power. And uh, we as the church, uh, we're the called out ones. The Bible says the church in the Greek is ekklesia. It means called out, called out of sin, called out of darkness, called out of the powers of the power of Satan. We've been called to prayer. And if we're going to make a difference in this area, in this city, in our lives, in our families, then we must pray as Peter and John did. I, as your pastor, I must be a pastor of prayer. Amen. You as a Christian must be a Christian of prayer. It's a wonderful tool. It's a wonderful thing. Jesus would go to a lonely place and get away from the crowds and the hustle and bustle of life. And he would get in a lonely place and he'd pray throughout the night. Paul said that we are to pray without ceasing. Praying will align our will up with the will of God. Praying will bring us into God's presence. Prayer. Peter and John were going to the temple about the ninth hour, about three o'clock in the afternoon. They were going to pray. The, the, the characteristics of a, the early church were that they had corporate prayer life. I want you to see this. And we try to practice this, not only on Sunday morning or Sunday night, but we try to practice this on the first and third Tuesday night of the month, just two nights out of the month, and we have corporate prayer. Acts 4 and 31, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together. Can you say assembled together? Where they were assembled together, uh, it says, was shaken. When they had prayed, the place where they assembled together, that's corporate prayer, was shaken. And I believe these early saints of God prayed with so much fervency, and they prayed with so much faith and determination and perseverance that the heavenlies were shaken. I believe they prayed with such power that hell shook. I believe that demons trembled. Something happened to such the effect that it was noted in the Bible. It was, it's in the scriptures. They prayed. The church, they gathered together. They assembled together and, and, and the heavens were moved. The place was shaken, glory to God. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the word of God with boldness. That's what happens when we get, when we spend time together in prayer, that God pours out the Holy Spirit. We're refilled with the Holy Ghost and power and we have this conviction and we're able to speak the word of God with boldness and power. Hallelujah. 
If you're feeling weak spiritually, if you're feeling down or depressed or discouraged, if you feel low and weak as if you've run low on spiritual strength, then this is the place to be. Amen. This is the place to be. Uh, this, you have every opportunity to come into the, what's more important tonight than his word? What's more important tonight than meeting with God? What's more important tonight than the church gathering together corporately to pray and to believe God for souls, for revival, for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, for the former and the latter rain, for deliverance and for healing? There are people I know that need healing. We'll get into that in just a moment, but it was noted in the Bible. They assembled together. The heavens moved. They were shaken. If you're, listen, my beloved, it, it, listen, it, as we gather in corporate worship and praise and prayer, there's something that takes place in the heavenlies. Right now, I believe that there's something that takes place in the, in the heavenlies. Did you bring your measure of faith tonight? Maybe some are running on a third cup, maybe half cup, maybe one cup. I don't know what it might be, but I pray that your cup runneth over. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I mean, my wife was sick and she had with COVID. We didn't know it was COVID at the time, but she was real sick or maybe it was the flu. I don't know. Maybe it was the flu this time. It was the flu, I think. Or whatever she had, she was sick this last time. I'm glad that we're doing better. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And, uh, and so uh, she was just too sick to fix anything. So uh, yours truly got into the kitchen. Hallelujah. You ladies, you're going to love this. Got into the kitchen, and I opened up the pantry, and I'm looking for something to eat. Well, I stumbled across two packages of muffin mix. Muffin mix. And so I looked at the instructions. Uh, Jeffrey, I read the instructions, and, uh, and it said all I had to do was add a, a cup of milk. That's all I had to do. What? I thought, man, anybody can do that. So I got the bowl out and I got the spatula out and I put, dumped it in there and I got the measuring cup and, and I, I, I poured that and to put a whole cup of milk in there and I got a cup of milk and I poured it in the bowl. I began to mix it up and my wife came in. She says, what are you doing? I said, I, I'm going to, I'm making us some muffins for dinner. <laughs> Blueberry muffins, some other kind of muffin. I don't know what it was, but they're muffins, man. Dinner. And, and she goes, oh, that, she says, how much milk did you put in there? And I said, well, I put a cup of milk in there. And she took the measuring cup. She says, did you put it here or did you put it here? And I said, I put it here. <laughs> put too much milk in there. Uh, and down in Louisiana, the excess or the extra they call lanyap. And so I realized, what am I going to do now? I was kind of upset with myself because I put too much in there. And, and so, you know, I, I took the spoon. I had an idea, and I just started spooning out the milk. <laughs> and I spooned out the milk until I thought it had the right consistency. And do you know those things were good? Amen. I guess what I'm just trying to say here tonight is I'd rather have too much than too little. Amen. That's what I'm just trying to, if the church, hallelujah. Amen. If God pours out the Holy Ghost, if he pours out the oil and the wine, I don't want to spoon it out. I want more. Give me more, 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 more. Hallelujah. I want God to pour out of the Holy Ghost upon you, upon word of life, upon every child of God, regardless of what their denomination is, because Pentecost, the power of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a gift of God. It's according to the word of God, and it's what's needed today to get the power back, to get the authority back, to get the conviction back. We need the oil. We need Christ. We need the Holy Ghost to get the fire back, church. Get it back. All right, now. Praise God. I got time to preach, okay? God, God took notice of Paul and Silas who were beaten and thrown into prison. You know the story. It's a dark night. It was midnight. They were hurting. They were broken. They were bleeding. They were probably beat to an inch of their lives. Scripture says in Acts 16, 23, and when they had laid many stripes on them, it was not easy. They didn't quit. They didn't throw in the towel. I'm sure every demon in hell was screaming in their ears. Where is your God now? If you had faith, you would not be here. This would not have happened. If God loved you, then he wouldn't allow this to happen to you. There must be sin in your life. But the Bible said in Acts 16, 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas are praying. 
glory, 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 glory. Do you see that? That gets to me. Doesn't that just excite you? Amen. Amen. Despite the most difficult of circumstances, hardships, adversity, harsh conditions, they didn't give up. They didn't quit. They didn't murmur and complain. They didn't make up excuses. But God looked down and finds them in their garden of Gethsemane praying. And then something wonderful and marvelous happened. The place where they gathered together was shaken. And there was a spiritual shakening. The heavens opened up and God sent an earthquake. Glory to God. Listen to this in Acts 16, 26. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Do you know anybody in bondage right now? Do you know anybody in sin? Do you know anybody in gross wickedness right now? They're in bondage. I want you to catch this. They're in bondage. They're bound by sin. They're blinded by Satan. And they need Pentecostal people like yourselves that will gather together and to pray that the heavens might be shaken. Listen, beloved, as a result of their faith, as a result of prayer, chains were broken, shackles were broken, chains came falling off, doors were opened. If we could gather together and believe God and pray, the heavens can be shaken and God can pour out his spirit upon us and people that are bound can be loosed and chains and addictions can fall off in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. There's nothing like the name of the Lord. Bible said, five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Leviticus 26 and 8. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Oh, just think of the difference that could be made and just a few saints of God gathered together to believe God for the unbelievable. My Lord. And before the night was over, the jailer and his household got saved. These are the things that happen when God's people take the time to get a hold of God. If you're, it, religion doesn't do this. Religion doesn't do this. So there are people today that don't believe in this anymore. They say it's passing. It died out when we got the Bible. Uh, died out when we got the Bible. I guess when we got the Bible, nobody needs healing. I guess when we got the totality of the word of God, nobody needs a miracle now. Nobody needs prayer. That's the lamest, dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Thank God we have the word of God. Didn't die out when we got the Bible. Listen to me, Mr. Dr. Theologian. Didn't die out when the apostles died out either. Amen. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God that healed in the Old Testament heals in the New Testament. Heals today. The God that poured out in Acts 2 is the same God that pours out today. The problem is getting the people to believe God for more. Amen. Give me two cups of milk, not just one. Elisha, Elijah asked, what, what do you want? Before I leave, before I depart, he says, I want a double portion. My Lord, of your spirit, I want a double portion. Hallelujah. He said, you stick with me, you'll get it. You understand? I'm just kind of paraphrasing the whole thing, but you stick with me. And Elisha stuck with him until he saw God take him up in a chariot and whirlwind and fire. God saw, amen, Elisha saw, and he had a double portion of the Spirit of God upon his life. And after Elisha died, his bones were in a cave. And the scripture there in the Bible, I can't remember exactly what the name was, but anyway, there was a guy that died. And so they were, they were burying him. They are putting him in a cave. And the enemy came. And when the enemy came, they said, we got to hurry up and get out of here. So they took this man's body that died. And they chucked him in the cave that Elisha was in. And that dead man touched the dead bones of Elisha. And the man came up and rose from the dead and was alive. That's what I'm talking. It's the same God. Oh, Lord, help me. It's the same Holy Ghost. <laughs> it's the same Holy Ghost. Give me a double portion. I can tell you're already more hungry now than you when you first came tonight. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, yes. We have the account of the Bible where Peter was put in jail. In fact, Herod was harassing the church, King Herod, and he was persecuting the saints of God. Herod had killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because it pleased the people, he was also going to kill Peter after Passover. In Acts 12 and 5 Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer 
was offered to God for him by the church. I love this. Constant prayer by the church. Not, not a five-minute prayer. Not a five-minute prayer, but a constant prayer was offered by the church. The saints of God said, we got to get a hold of heaven. And I, I just imagine they prayed around the clock. I, constant, you know, I'm sure there's somebody who's going to try to say that constant doesn't mean around the clock, but I think constant means around the clock. I think they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. They're going to kill Peter. They've killed James and now they're going to kill Peter if we don't get a hold of God. And so they prayed, whether they rotated, but they prayed. The word constant means earnest. It means a serious, intense prayer. In other words, they got down to business. Who was praying? The church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. They gathered together and got down and to serious praying. They sought the face of God. They interceded. They prayed. And God vindicated their prayers as an angel. You read it. An angel of the Lord came and delivered Peter out of jail. Hallelujah. He thought he's having a vision. A dream. And I love the way the scripture says in Acts 12 and 7. And his chains fell off his hands. We talked about that this morning. Pharaoh wants to keep you bound. Don't you know that Satan wants to cause us to be bound once again? Bound in unbelief. Do you know we are in chains spiritually? We are in chains if we don't have faith to believe God. We are in the chains of religion, shackled by the jail cell doors of religion. Bondage. It's miserable. Mm -hmm. Satan would love to cause us to be bound by doubt and unbelief and skepticism and so forth. Mm -mm, church, the devil would love for us to be bound in our own jail, trapped to where we couldn't do anything for God. Oh, Lord, trapped in the prison of fear. That's the problem today. We're trapped in the prison of fear. I'm sorry, church, but over a year ago, I quit listening and watching CNN and, and MSNBC and ABC and NBC and CBS. I, don't, I haven't watched it. I don't watch it. I don't want to watch it. I refuse to be brainwashed by a media that has their own agenda that is, does not know God. I don't need to hear what they have to say to try to warp the thinking of my mind, but I'll stay connected to this old word of almighty God for it is a truth and God does not lie his word does not lie his word will not come back void this is the answer get in the word you'll be connected to heaven connected to God you'll have the mind of Christ and God will show you the truth and God will reveal to you what is false yes sir Oh, prayer makes a difference. Tries to trap us with doubt and discouragement, depression, but prayer makes the difference. It's the answer to every problem. It's, uh, I know this is radical thinking and radical preaching. I, I know that. But I just look and see what they did in the Bible. It's incredible. And uh, I, I just know, I've experienced, I've, I've experienced his power, his delivering, his healing. Now, there, sometimes I had to go through surgery, but even in that, God's in control. But I've experienced his power for healing, unexplainable healing, unexplainable sickness and disease that doctors just did not understand. I went to Cleveland Clinic to the best of the best of the world. And they did not understand why I was having the problems that I was having. But when you get hungry enough, when you get desperate enough, when you get thirsty enough, when you begin to cry out with every fiber of your being, I need you, God, I need your deliverance, I need your healing, I need your help. And the Lord steps in. As, as you do the best that you can to walk in that obedience to God, as you do your best to, to walk in faithfulness to what God has called you to be and to do, the healing comes. Oh, there'll be a time I know that God will take us home, whether it be through the grave or through the rapture, I don't know. But I know this one thing, 
It, you only got two choices. It's through the grave or through the rapture that you're going to go to heaven if you're saved. That's the only choices you have. And when you go, you're not taking anything with you but your soul. That's the only thing. Not even the clothes on your back. Your soul. But I want you to know this one thing. If you're saved, we're all going to go to the same place. <laughs> John tells us in chapter 14, Jesus tells us that he's prepared a place for us. If we were not so, he would have told us. Amen. God's got a mansion. I don't have a mansion down here. I've got a house that's built 1911. Amen. It's got a roof that keeps the rain and the cold off of us. I've got a food on the table and clothing on our back. I know, but listen to me. I might not have much down here, but when I'm in heaven, I want you to stop by and see what God has built for me. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. We're heaven back. All right, we need to have our mindset on the Lord Jesus Christ, on God, on eternal things. Amen. Praise God. Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, in John 14 and 14, he said, I will do it. If you ask in my name, I believe that if we would pray, then the very religious foundations of the city of Marion, Ohio, would be shaken. Maybe our comfort zone would be shaken. Maybe our apathy would be shaken. Maybe our carelessness for spiritual things would be shaken. Maybe the powers of darkness would be shaken. But friend, revival is always preceded by prayer. Revival is a result of praying. Pentecost came after the 120 were in the upper room praying for 10 days. They, G, Jesus told 500, but 120, 380 did not go to church, but 120 did. And they prayed for 10 days, and suddenly there came a sound of a mighty rushing wind. Divided tongues as a fire sat upon each of them, visible fire. They saw it. It was the presence of God. And the Bible said they spoke into the tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The power of God. The presence of God. They spoke in tongues. What is upper room praying? It's undistracted praying. It's praying out of obedience. It's prayer with purpose. It's prayer with hope and expectancy. It's praying with faith. It's praying corporately. It's praying whether you feel like it or not. It's praying knowing that something is about to happen. We need upper room praying in our lives. We need it. We need it. We need it. I, I miss my daughter immensely. I, I'd, I'd have her back if I could. But I'm torn in my heart because when you feed over 500 people or 550 people the other day, I, my heart breaks. I want to be there so bad because that's the heart of God. I, I, if I can get on an airplane and jump over there and just help her do that one time, I just the heart of God, to see, to feed, to put that gospel track in every sack or every lunch or every whatever it is, the food that they give them, 550 gospel tracks, 550 gospel messages, the gospel of Christ, the cross, the blood of Jesus, how these people that are in darkness, in gro gross darkness because of their bondage, uh, they're Buddhists, they don't know God, they know religion. And in a Buddhist religion, basically they're trying to work their way to purity. You cannot work your way to purity. All the work you do does not bring purity. It does not wash your sins away. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can do that. It's more than a warm meal in the belly. We're talking about the gospel that will set the captive free. To open the eyes of these people that are in darkness, that are blind, that cannot see. And I say that young lady has touched more people's lives in in just a few months, I think, and I've done in 22 years in Marion. Just like that. Of course, there are 15 million people in Bangkok. But as a pastor, I just struggle with Marion. I struggle with this city. They want their play religion. They want their play church. They want their little band. They want their little, their little ceremony. They want their little religiosity. They want their, 
well, your church service starts at 9.30 and the next one starts at 10.30. I can't operate like that. I'm a weirdo. I'm a fanatic. You, you guys got a, a wild beast. I don't know what you got on your hands. You, I, I just, I can't operate like that. I shoot from the hip. Hey, man, I, I, I just, I can't operate like that. I can't do that. I can't have a set time when a service is, well, I can have a set time when it begins, but I don't know when it's going to end. When the service time starts, Sunday school is 9.15. We try to start service at 10.30. 10.30, what time is it over? I can't tell you that. We mean I can't tell you that. Well, because that wind just might blow. That river might flow. We might get a form of light of rain. You just don't know what's going to happen. What do you mean? We're Pentecostal. We love God. We'll pray. Sometimes we'll sing it 40 times. I don't know. We'll sing it over and over and over. If the Spirit of God is touching hearts and people are praising God, why would you stop it? Sing it again. Sing it again. Sing it again. Somebody's getting a blessing. Sing it again. Somebody's getting outpouring. Sing it again. People say, I've never been in church like that. That's the problem. You get too many churches that are run by Pharisees and Sadducees today. That's the problem. It's mechanical. It's big business. It's Ken and Barbie. This is my wife and I, is as close as the Ken and Barbie you're going to get here, okay? <laughs> I think you know what I'm talking about. That is not what changes lives, but it's the gospel, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord. Where's your faith? The upper room and my daughter, I'd, I, like I said, I'd have her back if I could. I, but I can't do that. I can't force her, although the dad in me would, for her safety and security. And when she messaged me the day and said someone ran into the back of her scooter with her on it, I do. The rescue daddy wants to. All right. But her room is upstairs, and so that's where she lives at home. When she's here, she has a room upstairs. It's like an apartment. She's got a bathroom. She's got a, an office. She's, believe me, she uses every inch of the upstairs and our basement and our garage and the attic of our garage. <laughs> and so I use her room now, and I, I go up there to pray. I, I pray here at the church. I pray in my office, but it's hard to pray in my office because I get a lot of distractions. I got too many books, and the phone is in there, and and there's just I get very distracted in my office. It's very hard to pray there, and so I, I like to pray where I just leave the phone downstairs, and I can go up and, and I call it the upper room, and I go up there and I pray, and I tell you the presence of God, the Lord meets me there. He's faithful. He's faithful to meet me there. I just, it's my closet. It's more, it's her bedroom, but it's my closet. And I just, I pray. Amen. I fall to see God. Brother Tim, last night I was praying in that upper room. <laughs> and uh, while I was praying, I stumbled across. She has a little bag of candy that wasn't open. And I walked away from it. And then I came back to it. <laughs> And then I prayed some more. And then after I was finished praying, I thought, I don't know when she's coming back. It'll probably spoil or go bad. <laughs> Jeffrey, I opened up the candy. <laughs> I took a few pieces and I put it back where it belongs. I don't know if she'll notice. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, you know, there's a little joy on the way when you pray. Amen. There's a, there's a little blessing on the way when you pray. Hallelujah. The Lord helps us out. Amen. But there's upper room praying. Praise God. That's what we need. Church, don't let the devil talk you out of praying. Don't think that your praying doesn't matter. Don't, don't let the devil tell you that it's not important. Elijah was one man, but one man who believed in the power of prayer. And he prayed fervently and earnestly. He prayed with passion and power. His life had impact. Moses prayed. Abraham interceded. King Jehoshaphat prayed and got a word from God. And God delivered him from his enemies. Elijah prayed. Samuel was a man of prayer. And he ministered at a young age unto the Lord. David prayed and God protected him. Paul prayed and shook the universe. Daniel prayed and the heavens knew it. Peter learned the principle of prayer. John prayed and God showed up. On the island of Patmos, he fell as a dead man at the presence of God. A church that doesn't pray will be powerless and ineffective with very little impact. We're wasting our time. See, prayer, this is what it does, folks. 
The flesh hates it. Just can be honest with you. The flesh hates it. But prayer puts the fire back in your soul, in your heart. It keeps it burning. Prayer, prayer, amen. Prayer puts the power back in the preaching. It makes praise powerful. What qualities do we see with the early church? They prayed, and as a result, they were filled with the Spirit of God. They had boldness to preach His Word. They were full of courage that was born out of conviction. They were Pentecostal in belief and in action. They were true Pentecostals. What do I mean? They lived it. Don't you want to live it? Don't you want to live it? Don't you want to be true Pentecostal? Not just, not religious, but in action, in belief, in lifestyle. Amen. Oh, Lord God, hallelujah. Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit. Cultivate a hunger in our hearts for prayer. I know it's the answer. Makes a difference. Makes a difference. One of the ladies of the church this morning, excuse me, Lord Jesus, help me. And she would leave and she, she just was thanking me for the preaching of that word. And she said she agreed with every word. She agrees with it. She loves the truth. She just thanked me. And then she said, I can tell you spend a lot of time with the Lord. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I do, but in my heart, I always feel like I could spend more time. And I told my wife that today, and sometimes this is just the way it is. Pray in that upper room. I get along with God. If it's a crazy, wild, busy day, it's most, I have 15-hour days a lot of times, two or three times out of the week, 15-hour days. And I'll pray on my bus. I'll pray on my bus between routes. I'll pray in my car. I'll pray in the shower. <laughs> I'm praying mindful of God, mindful of the Lord. Just God consciousness praying. Amen. God, put a fire in us. Put a fire in us. Praise God. Tonight, I'm going to do something kind of crazy before we play any music. It's not crazy. It's just the right thing to do. But I, I, I think about how important it is, prayer in the family. And I cannot express to you, married couples, how important prayer is for your marriage and for your family and for your life. And so tonight, I'd like the entire church to stand if we could. And I want us all to pray. I want us all to come up here. But before, Abby, you go to the piano because they're, they're at the piano and I feel, and I thank God for that. But I don't want them to miss out. But... I would like all married couples to come here tonight. Uh, stand up here with your husband, with your wife. All married couples, come on here tonight. And just stand right here, right here in the front. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Bring your husband, bring your wife. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come on. We got more. Sister Jan, Brother John, you can come on tonight. It's okay. Yep. Come on. If you're a married couple here tonight at the church... I, I, I want you to come here. Praise God. My wife's going to Praise God. Come on, sweetie. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I'd like the rest of the church, if you would, come stand behind him. Come stand behind him tonight. Amen. Come on this way. Move over. Sister Izzy. Sister Izzy. Guys, I can't. It's hard. You're my daughter-in-law. Don't call that. Mrs. Malden. <laughs> Amen. Come on. Come, amen. There you go. You got it. All right. Come on, church, and stand behind him tonight. Praise God. We've got we've got a couple a couple that's been a couple couples here been married for, for many years. We have new couples that haven't been married for one year. This church needs to support them and pray for them. Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to lay hands on them and believe God for them and God would strengthen them and God would cultivate a prayer life and a life of prayer in their families. Husbands, you have the remarkable um, responsibility of being the spiritual leader of your home. That means you lead your spouse. You lead your wife in prayer.
You pray together as much as you can. You have devotions together as much as you can. I know life gets busy, and I know that these things can get away from you. I realize that. It happens to my wife and I, and we stop, and we say, wait a minute. What happened to the times that we prayed together or we read together or had devotions together? And so we have to backtrack, and we go back, okay? And we say, we want to make it right. And so we begin again, and we begin again. And I cannot express to you how important this is. And so tonight, I would just like the church to lay hands on you in the name of Jesus and begin to pray for them. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, we love you. We praise you in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Worthy are you, God, of all praise, Father God. <coughs> Lord, we love you. And God, we know and realize without you, we have no power whatsoever, nothing of ourselves. But God, I thank you for these young married couples. I thank you for their life. I thank you, God, for the work that you're doing in their heart, in their life, in their home, in their marriage, God. And I know how the enemy fights a godly marriage. I know how the enemy fights Christian couples that are trying to live their life for God. So, God, we come against the powers of darkness in the name of Jesus. And I pray, God, that you would cultivate a hunger and a thirst and a desire for God and for prayer and to seek your face as they do this together, God, I pray. Hallelujah. God, I'm asking Lord that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon them. I pray that you'd open up the heavens and you would bless their home, bless their marriage, bless their relationship in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. For God, we need you. We have no power without you. We have no wisdom without you. We have no courage without you. Father God, I pray in the name of the Lord, Father God, that they love God together, that they serve God together, that they worship God together, that they pray to the Lord together. I'm asking in the name of Jesus, that God, that you would pour out your spirit upon them. Hallelujah. I pray that their love for you would grow more and more by the day, and their love for one another would also grow and increase by the day. Father God, they work hard, they have responsibilities. They get tired. They get worn as well, especially in the day and time that we're living in today. And the things that come against them with our nation and with our world that when I was younger never had to confront or deal with. But God, you are almighty. And God, you are wonderful. And God, you are all powerful. And God, you are magnificent. And we glorify the Lord. And we pray, God, that you would do a deep inner work in every husband and every wife to Together, do a deep work in their hearts and in their lives and fill them, Lord, with the Holy Spirit, I pray, for we need the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Father God, develop a foundation in their hearts and in their lives that will live their life for you forever and eternity, that will bring you honor, that will bring you glory in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let their lives and marriage be a living testimony of what God has done and what God is doing in their lives. I pray. Hallelujah. And the gates of hell shall not prevail to be able to prevail against them, I pray in the name of the Lord. God, we love you and we praise you and we worship you tonight and we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Now, as, as we just, I would just like to ask the church just to spend a little time up here together in prayer. Spend a little time together worshiping the Lord. Spend a little time just giving God the praise and the glory tonight. And I would just like to ask you to make a difference in your life. God, change me. God, change my prayer life. God, help me to make more room for you. Help me to, Lord, spend more time with you and time in prayer and time in your word. I pray in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, Abby, if I could have you play something softly there, I'd appreciate that. And I'm just going to ask this church, I'm going to ask you to go to the Lord. I'm just going to ask us together to pray and to believe God. God, to believe God for souls, to believe God for the, the, the lost to be saved, for the backslider to come back to the Lord, believe God for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, believe God for a move of God in our hearts and our lives. God, change us, change me. Father, in the name of the Lord, cause me, put a fire in my heart, cause me to cry out to you, cause me to pray, cause me to worship. And there needs to be something from the inside. There needs to be some kind of effort, an expression of faith. 
Don't, don't sit back in your comfort zone. But there needs to be something on the inside that says, I want God. I want Jesus. And you begin to cry out to him like blind Bartimaeus did. They're crying in your heart. And if there isn't a cry in your heart, ask God to put one there. But a cry in my heart, oh God, because we're living in desperate times. God, I see the qualities of a Pentecostal church. The characteristics, God, is that they were a people that prayed. They were a people that believed God. They were a people that sought the face of the Lord. And so I pray in the name of the Lord. Just begin to praise Him. Begin to worship Him. Begin to cry out to Him tonight. And believe the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus, 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 hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus, that there be a cry in your heart, a cry in your heart for God, a cry in your heart for Jesus, amen, hallelujah, I cry out to him, I cry out to him, I cry out to him, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I cry out to God. Lord Jesus, I need you. Put the fire in my heart. Pour out your spirit in my life, in my heart. God, I pray in the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, your touch makes the difference, God. We need you, Lord. We need you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 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 In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, bring healing in the name of the Lord by the power of the Holy Ghost. I pray in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we cry out to God. We cry out to God. We cry out to God. Put it in our hearts, God. We want the fire of the Lord in our hearts, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for souls. We pray for this city. We pray that bondages be broken. We pray that shackles and chains will fall off. We pray that jail cell doors would open. We pray for the backslider. We pray for souls to be saved. We pray for the hurting, Lord, that you would touch them. I pray, God, in the name of the Lord, that you would do a mighty work. God, that something of heaven, something of the Lord, supernatural, the moving of God, the spirit of the Lord, that you would baptize in the Holy Ghost. Where's the cry, my children? Where's the cry? Where's the cry? Where's the cry? God, I want more. I want more, Jesus. I want more. Hallelujah. We pray the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, for with God nothing is impossible. He is our Savior. He is our healer. He is our deliverer. He's a miracle-working God. His word will not lie, and it will not come back void. Jesus, hallelujah, just began to say that name, Jesus, 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 hallelujah, Jesus, oh God, we praise you tonight. That's it, let God just flow all over you. The Holy Ghost of God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God touch us in the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. By the power of your spirit. By the power of your spirit, God. We love you. We praise you. We pray for this city. We pray, God, against the strongholds, against the darkness, against religious and religiosity and religious pockets and strongholds, God. We pray against it. Lord God, I pray in the name of the Lord that this city would experience revival and the outpouring of God and of your spirit. I pray. Oh, God, I pray. Jesus, we cry out to you. We worship you, Lord. We need you, Jesus, oh God. We praise you, Lord, tonight. We magnify the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Come believing, come expecting, come believing God by faith. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, oh God, we worship you. God, we praise you. We need you, Jesus. for God, for the living God. Father, that you would do something mighty in us. Let it begin tonight. Let it begin tonight to put that hunger and desire in our hearts for you, for prayer, for your presence, for your nearness. I just want the Lord. I realize I'm nothing without him. I cannot make it without him. I need him. I need him. So I pray, begin tonight, Lord. We open our hearts to you. Please, oh yes, hallelujah, Jesus. Come with the hunger on Sunday night. Come with expectation. Come believing God for more. There's no better family time than this tonight. Than being in the house of the Lord with your wife, with your husband, with your children, with your grandchildren. There's no better place to be but in the presence of God, experiencing the, the Spirit of the Lord, experiencing the preaching of the Word that will penetrate our hearts and lives. Hallelujah. To be able to come together and to worship. 
worship the creator of the heavens and the earth. My God, my Savior. The Lord is in, in this He's place. in this place. against it in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for souls to be saved. I beg you for souls to be saved. I pray that we'd see a flood of souls being saved. I pray, God, for a flood of people that get saved, that give their heart to the Lord, that, that give their life to Christ. I pray in the name of the Lord. I'm asking in the name of the Lord. I believe in the name of the Lord. I pray in the name of the Lord. I believe in the name of the Lord. God, we pray for souls. We pray for souls. We pray that you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We pray that God would shine upon you. We pray in the name of the Lord that God would bless you, bless your home, bless your families. We pray in the name of the Lord that everywhere your foot trods, God will bless you with his presence and with his glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, we need you, God. We need you, God. We need you, Lord. We need you. the church to be able to partner with someone to pray with tonight, but I would like for you husbands to challenge you tonight to take your wife, take her hand, and I would just like to ask you to whether you go in your pew or you come or sit at the altar, or I would just like to ask you husbands to lead your wife in prayer tonight. I want you to bless her. I want you to pray for her. I want you to ask for God to overshadow her with his glory and pray for her. And that she would, as she grows in Christ, that she is going to be a wonderful woman of God, integrity, as she grows spiritually in Christ. And both of you are going to help each other and pray for each other. And you're going to live this life together for the Lord. You're going to learn, and God's going to show you, and God's going to minister to you. You'll make mistakes along the way, but the Lord is there to help you. When we fall down, he'll pick us back up, but you're there for one another. You pray for one another. You're on the same team. You are for each other, and you're a godly family. You're a God-fearing family. You believe the Lord. Jesus Christ is your Savior, and he is your foundation. Pray for your wife. Amen. Go to your wife. Take her by the hand and pray for her tonight. Take her by the hand. Pray for her. You're in this together. You're in this together. Where is my wife? <laughs> Where's my wife? There she is. All right. Church, find someone. Pray with them tonight. Uh, just gather together and pray. Partner up tonight and pray.
praise God. I don't know if it's the right thing to do, but I pray my wife wouldn't burn my soup anymore. Amen. <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> Amen. I love it. I love it. Praise the Lord. You young married couples, uh, we continue to pray for you. Uh, my wife and I have 29 years. Brother Leroy has 50. They, they've learned a few things along the way. They've been through trials. They've been through mountains and valleys. They've been through difficulties. They've good times and times not so good. But I guarantee you that anybody that's been married, and some of maybe our spouse is already passed on, but you know without a doubt you could not make it without the Lord. You could not make it without Jesus, without the Lord. And I, I'm, I'm looking for God to, to raise up godly men, godly women, but just a heart after God that hunger for the Lord. But men, you have the responsibility to lead your family in the ways of righteousness, in the ways of the Lord. I couldn't think of a better way to be Pentecostal, full of the Holy Ghost yourself. Let the divided tongues as a fire sit upon you, not just on Sunday, but strive for that every day. Every day I want God. Every day I want to draw near God. Every day I want His presence. Some days are going to be hard. Some days you wonder if you're even saved. Some days you wonder where God is. Some days you're going to come home frustrated, tired, weary, worn out. Some days the devil is hitting you and fighting you head on. Just remember this whole thing is spiritual. Remember that the devil would love to take you down, take you out, take your marriage out. But remember now you're in this together. Recognize this. Families recognize this. My wife and I recognize when we feel oppressed, when the enemy's coming in, we say, wait a minute. We feel this, we know this, the devil's fighting, so we pray against it. We come against it in prayer. The devil hates prayer. The devil hates you talking to God. He hates the fact that you tap into heaven. He hates the fact we have the Bible, the truth. He hates the fact that we have the Holy Ghost, the fire, the power. He hates it. He hates it. But he cannot stop it. The hate gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. It will not take over, will not win. I might fight it, but it will not take over. Amen. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. What song are you singing? Sings my soul, my Savior God to stand together tonight. God bless you. Tuesday night we have prayer at 7 o'clock. I hope that you can make it after this tonight. I, I pray you can. Amen. Last prayer meeting we had a couple weeks ago we had a great turnout. And I just felt the power and the presence of the Lord. Let's pray for souls to be saved. Pray for this city. Pray like you've never prayed before. We're coming to the end of times. We are in the end of times. We're coming to the brink of the rapture of the church. If we're still here on Tuesday, come to prayer. But I'm telling you, we're on the brink of the rapture of the church. If you find it hard to pray, pray harder. If you find it hard to praise, praise harder. But let me see more effort out of you. Let me see a little bit more effort. Cry of your heart unto God. Amen. Cry unto God. Praise the Lord. Praise God. As we dismiss tonight, Brother Leroy, would it be okay if you pray for us tonight? Is that okay? Amen. Yes.
Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Be careful driving home. I don't know if the roads are slick or not, but you know how it is in Ohio. You drive slower. Amen. Just drive a little slower and you'll be just fine. God bless you. Have a great night. Amen.